we're surveying tonight Genesis four, Genesis uh, chapters four through chapter eleven. So obviously we're not reading every the, all the, one of those verses. We're we're spotting in and skipping a bit, but I am going to read certain passages, and I'm first going to go ahead and read Cain and Abel, the story of that. So let's start with Genesis chapter four, and I'll read a, a good little portion here. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, "I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord." And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel brought some of the firstlings from his flock, and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to Abel, his brother, Let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me this day away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden, and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will slay me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who came upon him should kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, so a lot going on there. And we don't know a lot of the details just from that text, right? Why, why, is, uh, why is Abel's sacrifice accepted and Cain's not accepted? Is, is God playing favorites? What's going on here? Now, we do know certain things from the text. There's, there's something wrong with Cain's sacrifice because when, he's, when Cain is huffy about it, God tells him, if you do well, you will, be, you will, uh, will you not be accepted? And if you do not uh, do well, sin is lurking at the door. So there was something not well. Cain wasn't doing well with his sacrifice. And then God gives this advice. But before we get to that, let's, uh, let's get a little clarification of this which we have in the book of Hebrews. Here we have uh, the writer of Hebrews saying, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. He died, but through his faith he is still speaking. Okay, so something to do with faith. Faith is the, uh, is the key here. Now, Remember our theme that we set up here with, with the beginning of Genesis. Adam was stop sharing that. Adam was reluctant to suffer for the sake of Eve. He was reluctant to suffer for his bride. He didn't want to have to fight for her and possibly die at the at the threat of this serpent. Or did Eve, you know, they were also seduced and tempted in other ways, you know, tempted to, to the knowledge, you know, tempted to be like God and so forth. All that's at play as well. But we set up this theme of a, of a reluctance to lay your life down in love, because that's what true love is. And we, and we looked, talked a little bit about how that's a central theme throughout the Bible and the sacrifices of the Old Testament, all the way ultimately to Jesus coming as, as the new Adam to willingly lay his life down where the first Adam refused. It, it, it deepens and makes the story more profound. It's not, oh, you mean so God cursed the whole human race because Adam and Eve ate an apple? Really? You know, people try and trivialize it, and they're just missing the point completely. It's it's a very deep and profound story. And we're seeing this theme here deepen as well, as well as the curse deepen. So what does it mean when Cain didn't offer his sacrifice through faith, but Abel did? Well, to sacrifice something that you have that's an act of faith. You think about later in the Old Testament, we'll see them 
commanded to tithe. The the Israelites are commanded to tithe from the first fruits, right? The first, the first uh, portion of their of their crops or whatever they make, ten percent of that is to go to the Lord. Not after all your expenses are paid, then ten percent of your profits. You know, then you can kind of think, okay, maybe that. No, it's an act of faith to give. I, I'm giving, you know, this portion. You know, it, it, like I said, the Israelites were commanded to give ten percent of tithe. Ten percent of that—that's an act of faith to to sacrifice and give to the Lord. So we can piece together here. Abel then is sacrificing the best of his flock. He's giving the best of his uh, sheep to sacrifice to God. Whereas Cain, it's not that Cain is sacrificing grain or, or vegetables or whatever instead of uh, um, livestock, because Cain is a tiller of the ground. That's his thing, and uh, and there are grain offerings and so forth as we'll see in the Old Testament. But it, clearly, Cain is not offering the best of the best. Cain's not, you know, however this happens, however this played forth, he's not giving in faith, whereas Abel was. And, and if you're not giving in faith, if you're not willing to sacrifice your goods, well, that's also a way of not willing to suffer, not willing to lay down your good, right, um, for God in this case. And God gives him some wonderful advice. You know, God doesn't curse him. He just doesn't accept his sacrifice. And he tells him. You know, why, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Okay, so, so the serpent is still active here. The sin is, the desire is for Cain. And God is warning him. You're, you're in a vulnerable place right now. Sin is right there. And Cain doesn't take that warning and, and think, right, I need to do better. Cain instead lashes out at Abel. Because Abel is like holding up a mirror to Cain's sin. Abel is, is, is Abel's actions and his right sacrifice to God is showing Cain, hey, it's possible. Yeah, you can you can do this. You can give of yourself selflessly in love. We can do that for God. Abel is that mirror held up to Cain, and that's why Cain despises him. So much so that Cain ends up killing him in the first murder ever. And this seems really you know, they're brothers. It seems really uh, extreme, but this is also a precedent and yet another, yet another theme that we're going to see in the Bible as we go forward. I'll bring up my PowerPoint once again here. Jesus will, will warn his disciples of this. Here's a wonderful image, um, uh, an ancient uh, re Renaissance painting of uh, St. Stephen, the, the first martyr there in the, uh, in the, um, book of Acts. But uh, Jesus told his disciples, brother will deliver up brother to death. This is what Cain did to Abel. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. That's why the world hates that's why the world hated Jesus and rejected Jesus. That's why the world hates those of us who try to follow Jesus. The, the world is your enemy. The world is going to try to persecute you in every way. It does not want you shedding that light and sharing and holding up that standard, holding up the standard and saying, hey, this is this is what you should do. There, there's right and wrong. There's there's love. There's true love. There's actual grace and repentance and so forth. The world doesn't want to hear it because the world's not willing to lay its life down. The world is not willing to to self-sacrifice. It wants what it wants when it wants and it wants it. And that's not that's not the way of uh, of self sacrifice of picking up our cross daily and following the Lord. So Cain slays Abel for that reason. Then I think it's interesting that he tries to hide it, buries the body, and then tells God, "Oh, I don't know where he is. What, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know." And this is a deepening of that of that issue that we saw when Adam and Eve first sinned and they hid from God as though they could ever hide from God. And we talked about how part of the initial curse there is you get a skewed knowledge of who God is. They knew God. They walked with God. They had an intimate knowledge of God. But suddenly, they had a skewed, like, as though they could ever hide from God. They had a skewed perception of who God was at this point. And we see that in Cain here as well. And we see God deepening the curse for Cain, just as the ground would, would only yield fruit and food for Adam through the, the sweat of his brow. Now it won't yield anything for Cain. Cain's cursed beyond even that. So we see principles happening here, a deepening of the curse. The curse can become more difficult. Sin, once you give in to sin, life becomes more difficult. Now, it's, it's certainly hard to deny yourself. 
uh, you have to kill off the flesh, you know, as Paul tells us later in the New Testament, you know, um, doing battle with the flesh and the spirit and so forth. But but they, they see a deepening of the of the of the curse there as well. Now, I'll move in just a little bit and I'm going to read another uh, another little. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Another little portion because we get some genealogies here. And people think genealogy is boring. Blah, I've heard them all. Uh, these are the parts that I skip. Not really. These are these are pretty important parts. We're going to get the line of Cain here. We're going to see here that you know uh, Eve's going to give birth again to Seth, and then Seth, in those days, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. All right. So the name of the Lord. So here, here's another theme that we're going to get: the name of the Lord. Adam, uh, Cain rather, has his own line here. And in Cain's line, we don't see godly people. In Seth's line, we see people like Enoch, who walked with God. I'll get to that in a moment. In Cain's line, though, we see a different kind of person. So remember that in the days of Seth there, people, the line of Seth, they began to call upon the name of the Lord. But in Cain's line here, we eventually get to one called Lamech. And in Chapter 4, verse 19, and Lamech took two wives. The name of uh, one was this, and that, and the other. Um, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Your wives, you wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So we get this, this line of sin through Cain, and what kind of sin? A sin of pride, right? Cain couldn't handle Abel holding up that mirror and showing him that there was a standard he was falling short of. In his line, we get Lamech. Lamech, who takes to himself two wives, not just one. We saw the importance in the sacred, beautiful image that marriage is there, one man and one woman. Lamech starts to, to, uh, to, to what's the word, corrupt that, get two wives, and then we also see his pride in that he was insulted by a young man and he killed the young man for daring. And not only that, in his pride, he says, you know, God said people would avenge uh, or he would avenge Cain's death, but I shall be avenged. I'll avenge seven times 70. Again, we're starting to see some of these themes come forward here as we move through. Let me bring my PowerPoint back up. This progression from away from God's covenant, Cain murdered and would be avenged sevenfold. Lamech murdered two wives, breaking covenant for him, took his own vengeance on uh, one who wounded him and murdered, uh, said he would be avenged 77-fold. And yet Christ, the new Adam, again, we're constantly going to be looking toward Christ. And even when we get to the New Testament, we'll be looking back at this, the ways that Christ is undoing this curse. What did Christ tell his disciples? What did he tell Peter? Peter said, uh, how many times should we forgive our brother? Seven? Seven times? That's, that's pretty good, right? I'm holy if I can forgive him seven. And Christ said, no, seven times 70 rather than take revenge. So an, an undoing of these of this of this pride of the central original pride here, and hide this again. There we go. That's the easier way to do it. So I can get back and forth pretty easily. So we get Seth's line. Enoch walked with God, and he was. Um, and then he was not. God took him as an assumption of, of Enoch. You know, we uh, Catholics believe in the assumption of Mary, which isn't written out in the Bible that she was assumed. But the idea of assumption is nothing unbiblical at all. Enoch, Elijah, you know, there, there have been those who were assumed into heaven. And eventually in Seth's line, we get to Noah. And when Lamech had lived a hundred and uh, this is a different Lamech, not the Lamech and Cain's line. This is a Lamech and Seth's line. Uh, 82 years, uh, he began the father of a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. All right. So again, remember the curse was that the, the ground wouldn't yield as easily. And in Seth's line, we have people who call upon the name of the Lord. Right. This is very key. The people who call upon the name of the Lord. And yet, in Cain's line, we have people who are trying to make a name for themselves. Like if Cain is avenged seven, uh, 70 fold, I'll be avenged 77 fold, you know, and so forth. So now this brings us to Genesis chapter six. So remember our theme here of we have the line of Seth, 
who are calling upon the name of the Lord. And we have the line of Cain who are out there to make a name for themselves. Genesis chapter six, when man began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took to wife such as them as they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh, but his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they were children to them. They were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. What in the world is this talking about, right? Um, it's so many great, really, really fun, like uh, fantasy stories or mythological stories uh, have been written. I've heard of, you know, where, where the, the, the spawn of the angels and humans, you know, and like, you know, or so maybe demons and humans, you know, because, but they're called sons of God. So they couldn't be demons. Well, again, think about our, our progression of context here. The sons of, uh, the sons of men saw the daughters of, um, or the sons of God saw the daughters of men. We have two lines here. We have those who are calling upon the name of God. Well, this is Adam's lines through Seth. Adam was the son of God. We talked about this when we're talking about creation. Adam was created to be a son. Remember, the Bible says that Adam bore a son in his own likeness and image. And we looked at that language. That's what God created Adam in, in his own likeness and image. God created Adam to be his son. So Adam was the son of God. And his lines continued in, in obedience for God, turning back to God through Seth. So we have the sons of God in that respect. And the daughters of men, this is Cain's line. So basically what it's talking here is about unequal yoking, right? Um, the, the the sons of God, those who are who are supposed to be from a godly line, calling on the name of the Lord, are starting to be seduced by the ways of the world, literally seduced by the the women of the world, the daughters of men. And they produced these, these individuals, the Nephilim, uh, sons of God came in, the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. All right, so that word in Hebrew there for men of renown, Literally translated, that means men of the name, men of the name. We're, we're going to keep with this theme of the name. Men of the name, meaning men who were trying to make a name for themselves. They were bold before God. They, they, they wanted to do it for themselves. They, they, were, they were all about their own pride. We're going to see this develop, and, and I'll show you, especially once we get to Nimrod and so forth, and ultimately to Shemham and Japheth here. But men who, uh, men who were of the name, men of their own name, meaning... We're doing this for ourselves. We're, we're doing. We don't need God. We're here to for our, build our own glory, not God's. That's what's happening, and that's what God is reacting against when He wants to send the flood. And this is a new covenant. We're going to enter into a new covenant with Noah here. And I'm not going to read as much from the text here, uh, at least at first. But I do want to to just show a few things here. So let me pull up my PowerPoint there again. In the Noah, there's the flood of Noah. You guys know the story. If you haven't read it, I do. I do suggest you read it. Read ahead. You know, read the, the book of Genesis as we're going through. But we we have very uh, a lot of similarities to the creation story. It's a new creation, basically. God is is quote unquote recreating the earth in a way, and we have similarities between these two covenants, between the Adamic covenant and the Noahic covenant that we'll get into. But for example, in the story of Noah. Noah's the one, remember that uh, Lamech names him Noah because he says he's the one who's going to redeem, you know, the curse for us. He's going to, you know, draw God's blessing back upon us. And that is what happens when everybody's so evil that God looks for a righteous man, finds Noah and his family. And we know the story. He gets two of each kind of animal on the ark and, and survives through the flood. And that story is, is very profound in itself. A lot of sermons are written on that 40 days and 40 nights, you know, that the flood happens and that's a number of testing 40. It's a number of testing. It's why we are in, currently in our 40 days of Lent. Jesus would be tested in the wilderness for 40 days. And the ark itself is a picture of the church. You know, the church teaches that the ark in, in uh, the flood is a type of baptism, you know, the ark um, weathering this. Peter tells us in the New Testament, it's a type of baptism, a picture of baptism. Seven in all were saved as through water, you know, through baptism. And the ark is a picture of the church. And you you stay, you know, as, as crazy as the world becomes, as rocky, as, as, as uh, torrential as the floods of the world come, you stay in the ark, you stay in the church. Even when the church gets a little 
weird <laughs> when and corrupt at times, which it certainly has through history, certainly has in recent history. But that's the arc. You don't go jumping off the arc just because, you know. So um, so it's a good picture there. But some uh, some similarities here. The world emerges from water, just as God created the the earth in Genesis one. First of all, there was just water, no uh, water everywhere in, in the land emerged from it there was separation of water and dry land well here after the flood the land emerges from water the covenant number of seven is present again seven peoples um we find the holy spirit the uh the dove remember the dove is a picture of the holy spirit it comes down and rests upon jesus after his baptism in the form of a dove so uh noah sends out a dove to try to find dry land so the and the, got the dove hovering over the water then. So you've got the image or symbol of the, the Holy Spirit hovering over the water, just as the Spirit of God hovered over the waters in, in the beginning of uh, Genesis. Adam and Noah are both commanded to be fruitful. Noah, again, is, you know, you know, repopulate the land, be fruitful. Adam and Noah are given dominion over animals. Remember, Adam was given dominion uh, to, to of all the land, you know, before the curse and just to name them and so forth. Well, Noah's given a certain amount of dominion to, to take them onto the ark. And God re renews the Adamic covenant with Noah. So when we're talking about these different covenants, we're not saying, yeah, God decided he was done with that agreement. Nah, he was done with those promises to Adam. Now he's just going to start fresh. No, he's it's, it's a renewal. It's a deepening. Each covenant, remember, this is a progression. As we go through these covenants, ultimately, as we get to the new covenant with Jesus, this is going to be a deepening of covenant throughout until we, we get to God's original plan, which he's finally prepared us for, prepared the world for, which is the new covenant. So the uh, Edemic covenant is deepened and renewed through Noah. Adam and Noah found in the garden, right? Um, they're both interested in certain types of fruit that gets them in trouble. <laughs> the fruit of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil and the fruit of the vineyard. We'll find Noah's going to get drunk here, and this is going to cause some problems for him in a moment. So this is, uh, we see these similarities between the two. Now there's another another similarity here between the covenants. Go back. The Edenic covenant has a uh, the mediator. So all of the covenants, as we'll see, we're going to go through, and we'll come back to this chart once we get to the Abrahamic covenant next week. We're going to add that in here as well. And this comes from Scott Hahn. He started this. The Cavens, uh, Jeff Cavens, uh, developed this a little bit, but this idea that you've got these these charts of the similarities between the covenants and the different roles. The mediator of the covenant, of the Adamic covenant, Adam, obviously. The mediator of the Noahic covenant is Noah. The role, Adam's role, was husband. Noah's role is father. So we've gone from a marriage, just two people. The covenant's been deepened now into a whole household, the form from marriage to household. Now it's a, a form of household. Uh, the sign, each covenant has a sign, Sabbath, from the from, uh, creation story and it's the rainbow you know that sign that that uh of god's covenant that he made with noah never to destroy the earth again in that way and to go forward but you've got the the deepening here we're starting to see because we're going to see this broaden out even more with abraham but we've gone from marriage to a whole household and we're seeing that each with each renewal of the covenant with each deepening of the covenant god is is broadening it out just a little bit more until ultimately he's going to broaden it out to a people you know, a people of Israel, a nation, a kingdom, and then ultimately to the Gentiles as all, well, you know, in the new covenant, the whole world. So we're going to see that progression as we uh, as we work through that. But let's get back to this story of of uh, Noah here and go through a couple of parts here. So it gets a little it gets a little weird, right? At the end of uh, the story of Noah here. passage here to read. Noah and his sons. Um, Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard and he drank, and this is uh, Genesis 9, verse 20. I'm starting at verse 20. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. 
When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. Right, who's Canaan, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham's the one that did this. Who's Canaan? So cursed be Canaan. A slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. Canaan is is uh, is Ham's son. He also said, "Blessed by uh, blessed by the Lord my God, by be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in his tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave." After the flood, Noah lived 380 years, all the days of Noah's life. So Ham does something bad here, and God punishes his son. What does Ham do so bad? Ham uncovers the nakedness of his father. So, you know, I've heard people try to try to explain this and in some some pretty, you know, logical, reasonable ways. Well, he he disrespected his father. He saw his father drunk and naked and uh Maybe he kind of laughed at him. Maybe he was, you know, is that is that really caused to curse an entire line? Again, it's, it's sort of think about the the fruit of the good and, uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did Adam and Eve curse all of humanity because they just ate a, an apple or an ate a piece of fruit that Papa said not to? You know, it's more deep. It's deeper. It's more profound than that. Un, uh, uncover the nakedness of his father is a euphemism. It's a euphemism. And we see it later. We see it in Leviticus, for example. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. This gets weird. It gets disgusting. But this is what it does. Ham is the second oldest. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham lays with his own mother. Probably rapes her, let's be quite honest. Because that's what it would mean. That's his father's wife. There were no concubines. We know that for certain. There was These were the only human beings saved by the flood and alive at this point on the earth, according to the text. Ham is, is all in all likelihood raped his mother. You think that's terrible. Why, why would, what would even be the purpose of that? He had his own wife. What would be the purpose of that? The purpose of that is he's the second born. Remember we said that this is a patriarchal culture. The patriarch of the family, the father of the family, is the ruler of the family of the tribe as it would become and so forth. And the firstborn, the firstborn gets that blessing and gets that inheritance. Shem is the firstborn. Ham is the secondborn. Ham is trying to usurp his father's authority, trying to cut in line of Shem. This is, we see this done in the Bible quite a bit to David. When uh, David's sons are trying to uh, usurp him, they, they go and lay with his concubines. You know, we see this done uh, a number of other times in the Bible as well. People, it's, it's a way of asserting it's trying to steal their authority by laying with their woman you know this kind of thing in terms of the patriarchal authority and how that worked you know in terms of authority uh, uh passing down the line the word shem means name this is hebrew for name so canaan is the ill-gotten offspring from ham and the rape of his mother this is why noah curses canaan ham's son if Canaan was just Ham's son that he'd already had, like, what? what? Why would you curse him, right? But that line is cursed. So now what we see is we had the, the line of Cain, who was seeking to make a name for themselves, not turning to God. And we had the line of Seth, who was calling upon the name of the Lord. Well, that continues here after the flood. The line of Seth, who call upon the name of the Lord, continues through Shem, the word that very, the very word means name. And then we see the line of Cain, who tries to make a name for themselves, continue through Ham and his ill-gotten offspring, Cain, ill-gotten through a, 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 a an attempt to usurp authority. And we're going to see that line; those lines continue to develop and hold true. As we uh, go through, we're going to meet, um, where is he here? Got it. Uh, yeah, the line of Cain, the sons of Ham. Are, now, another thing, too, though, to, to talk about is... Here's a here's a map that'll show help uh, illustrate this. Okay. Noah said in his curse that Ham is going to uh, be, be constantly the son of Cain. These are the Canaanites, right? These are um, the Egyptians. These are the Philistines. These are the Canaanites. You can see this map here. Shem. Well, that's Israel there. The Israelites, the tribe of Judah and the tribes of Israel come from Shem's line. And we see the land they would inherit there. Ultimately, 
and we see the land that Ham's uh, descendants would would inherit. So we see that this is Babylon. This is this is um you know Egypt. These are the the enemies, the historic enemies of Israel here coming from Ham. So this line that began with Cain and Abel picked up through Seth versus Abel, their lines, those who called upon the name of the Lord, those who tried to make a name for themselves, continued on through Shem and Ham's uh, descendants, or Shem and Canaan's descendants there, Canaanites. This is this, this is the whole history of the Bible and the conflicts of the Bible here. So when God leads Israel, ultimately, we'll get to this if you don't know what we're talking about, when God, God leads the, the people of Israel to go and take the land there where they or they're marked there for Shem, the, the Canaanites are there to begin with. It's not just taking an innocent people's land. That's taking the land that was rightfully theirs. According to this blessing and curse, uh, Ham is supposed to give that up for Israel, as we'll see. So let's uh, let's continue a little bit here as we um, start to kind of wrap up a little bit for tonight. And we're in the line of Canaan again. So this is the line of Ham and Canaan, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, uh, a bunch of names there. Uh, verse chapter 10, verse 8. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that phrase it kind of loses its meaning here for us in English, before the Lord. What that means is, uh, is like the men of renown, men of the name. Before the Lord is against the Lord. I'm a mighty, look what I can do, God. Look what I can do. That's it's Again, it's the line of Cain. Nimrod is showing his worth, showing his skills as against God are as without, separate from God. And this is important because Nimrod goes on and uh, to do some work here. Now the whole worth, uh, in chapter 11, now the whole earth had one language and few words. And as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and uh, bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower and with its top to the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let's we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see these, the, the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, there are one people. They have all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off the building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, Babel, uh, Babel, because the, the Lord confused the language of all the earth from the Lord there that the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. OK, so Nimrod's involved in finding this city here. He's either part of the land of Canaan here. And we get the descendants who want to found the city of Babel, and they want to build the historic Tower of Babel. This is not a tower as we think of uh, towers today. They wouldn't have had that architectural know-how in that day to build a straight-up tower. This would have been, in this time period, a ziggurat. If you ever took sort of a well, Western Civ, early Western Civ class, you might have uh, learned about this a little bit, or art history survey courses, the pre architectural precursor to pyramids, but their use is slightly different. Whereas a pyramid is, is done there to memorialize, you know, as a tomb for a pharaoh, the ziggurats are used to be temples. They're, they're these buildings that are supposed to re uh, resemble mountains. Here's a, an artistic depiction and actual literal uh, picture of, of some of the remains. They're, uh, supposed to resemble mountains. Now mountains are very symbolic in the uh, in the ancient world. The Mount Olympus. Mounts are where the mountains are where the gods reside, right? Uh, you know, pagan gods. The Mount Olympus, um, Thor and uh, gods were even supposed to, to uh, reside upon a certain type of mountain. We see this over and over in mythology. And it was an actual mountain. Olympus, for example, was an actual mountain. So these men in this city, as they said, come let us make a name for ourselves. Let us build our own mountain. Let us build our own re uh, residence of gods as though we are gods. There's this temple. Build it up. It, if you just read the text without this kind of context, you can think, okay, so they were trying to reach heaven? 
And then God's scared. God said, oh, my gosh, if they keep doing this, there's no limit to what they'll do. Oh, no, we got to we got to stop them now before while they're still manageable. No, God's omniscient. He's om omnipowerful. He's he's going to be able to, to take care of all of that. It's not about that. It's about if they continue in this practice, then man is suddenly going to become so hardened and so far away from God that he's never going to be able to reach him. Right. They're just constantly going to be thinking of themselves, making a name of themselves and so forth. So this is what God descends down to to thwart this plan and he does so by their language there's a lot we can say about that i think given my time period time here i'm gonna um stop on that a bit but let me uh just revamp here our theme turn for tonight which is about the name okay so seth's line would call uh, it was uh, it says in the time in the days of Seth, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. We see Enoch, we see Noah, we see the sons of God, right? As they were called because they were trying to call upon the name of the Lord, and ultimately Shem, which means name. Then, and, and we're going to see it as Israel all come from the line of Shem. And then on the other side, we see Cain, those who want to make a name for themselves, Lamech, you know. If Cain's avenged seven, I'll be avenged all the more. Uh, these are the sons or daughters of men. Ham and his son Canaan, his ill-gotten offspring Canaan, ultimately Nimrod there, the, the people who are trying to uh, build this Tower of Babel, let, it, let us make a name for ourselves. And I've got this verse up here from Romans, because this is the gospel of the New Testament. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean to call on the name of the Lord? And part of it here is this theme that we're seeing through Genesis develop. It's it's laying down your life for God and for others, right? Uh, not being, not thinking of yourself as God, not putting yourself on the throne of your life and of, and of, of your world, but putting God there, putting others before yourself. As, as Jesus says, when we'll, we'll get to the law, but as Jesus says, the two, you know, the greatest commandment of the law is love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and both of those commandments re require you to put yourself last. So put your name last. There's a lot, a lot we can talk about with this in terms of, and these, these are the, this is the stuff sermons are made from, right? You know, uh, what does it mean? What are we seeing in the world today? People trying to, to, uh, to make a name for themselves and everything like that. There's a lot of moral truths we can draw from this, but that's not the, the, within the boundaries of what I'm doing here. I'm doing a survey of the Bible course, but uh, it bears meditating over. It bears praying over, you know, in your own quiet time with God and and uh, ultimately in our own lives. You know, as we see this theme develop of uh, those who call upon the name of the Lord and are there for God, and his name are those who are there to make a name for themselves, you know, in what ways of, of our own life we can meditate over that. In what ways are we just out to make a name for ourselves? Maybe not all over the place, but, you know, this or that little area in our life where we're not really giving ourselves to God's will. We're demanding our own will or demanding our own recognition or something like that. It's, it's a useful meditation. So that is where I'll stop tonight.